Thank you so much for having me here today. I want to say thank you to Reverend Dan for the invitation, and also a thank you to Mark Simmons and Elaine and the team and all those who've worked so hard to make this rally day possible this weekend. I'm so honored to be here with you. We did some wonderful work yesterday. I came in from Texas. I'm from St. Mary's Episcopal Church in a suburb of Houston called Cyprus. And there were about 120 of you who came together to dream about how St. Luke's could become even more inviting, even more welcoming, even more intentional about building authentic relationships within the parish. And wow, I'm impressed by the energy and the inspiration that you have for this work. So today we have this great New Testament lesson from James about not showing preference to people because of their dress or status. James is actually my favorite book of the Bible because it's pretty straightforward. It's kind of the closest we're going to get to how to be a Christian handbook. And this first part's kind of a no-brainer, right? Let's show hospitality to everyone. What a perfect scripture for this weekend that we're focused on evangelism. But let's talk about that E word for a little bit. Evangelism is just sharing your experience of God and Jesus. Now, the word has gotten hijacked, and it has some negative connotations, like uh, asking people in the Starbucks line if they've been saved. But really, it's just about sharing the difference that being a Christian has made in your own life. We practiced this yesterday, and I think you all kind of learned some amazing things about each other and how God is working in your life. St. Luke's is our place to practice that so we can go out in the world and share it. Remember that what we do on Sunday is worship, but church is actually out there. The other thing that we practice here is loving well. Now, there's a part of James that wasn't read today that's in that same set of chapters that I'm referring to. Um, I realized that after the 8 o'clock sermon. Um, But he reminds us that if you want to fulfill the law, love your neighbor as yourself. And while you're at that loving your neighbor part, Please start acting like a people who have been liberated. Finally, he says that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy, not the law. And we take that mercy out into the world. In today's Gospel from Mark, we see Jesus choosing mercy. Now, I will admit I get a little twitchy whenever I read this Gospel because Jesus almost rejects someone. The Gentile woman begs him to heal her daughter, and he almost says no. Along with being fully divine, he was fully human after all. She was not part of the chosen people. We can assume she wasn't baptized. But he has mercy on her nonetheless. Nonetheless. She didn't earn this mercy. She didn't qualify for it. He healed her daughter anyway. And Jesus continually chooses mercy over rule following. Think about him healing the withered man's hand on the Sabbath. Jesus never chose to let someone suffer for the sake of the rules. We could use some of this in our world right now. This is the gift we have to offer, mercy. And it seems like a no-brainer as well, but apparently it isn't. I belong to some closed Facebook groups for online Christian community of various kinds. And every Christmas and Easter, the sad posts start coming in about people who wished they had a church to attend and the painful reasons why they don't. Sometimes parents have left their churches when their LGBTQ kids were condemned uh, by clergy or people they thought were their friends. Other times people are wounded by harsh fundamentalist traditions that they're recovering from and they left for their own emotional health. So one day I impulsively posted that I would help anyone find a safe church anywhere in the country if they wanted to go back to church. (laughs) Yeah, you you can laugh. Um, And so the first person that asked me for this kind of help was asking for an open and affirming church for LGBTQ folks um, in a small fishing town. And I thought, what have I done? (laughs) Me and my big mouth. But what do you know? There was the perfect loving church there in that community. Not only that, but this person was struggling with leaving the Catholic Church, and the priest there was a former Catholic priest. 
And so this is how I became a church finder. So I'm kind of like a bartender, um, kind of a spiritual bartender. I listen to a lot of stories of woe. And these experiences all have something in common, a lack of mercy. These people never stopped believing, but they stopped belonging. And I hear these stories of church experiences that were based on rule following and all the fear and judgment that goes with that. One mom said that she couldn't bear for her daughter to be brought up the same way that she was, being told over and over that God thinks she's inherently sinful and broken. This concept of you being so bad that your only hope is that Jesus might wink in your direction at the critical moment, it breeds a merciless self-loathing. And so when you're told to love others as yourself, well, <laughs> there you go. I call it recipe for ugly pie. And if you think about it, many Christians are being obedient to Jesus' command to love others as themselves. It's just that their bowl is full of bitter ingredients. It's a little hard to serve up mercy when you've never tasted any. And that is where you come in. We can serve up some mercy in the Episcopal Church. Our baptismal covenant is all about how to love well. Sharing the good news, it's actually good news here. Loving our neighbor, striving for justice and peace, seeking and serving Christ and all people, and respecting the dignity of every human being. If we want to fulfill the law and love our neighbor, it's already in our DNA. Because you see, we're not about doctrine. We're about right relationship. The fruit of the Spirit manifesting, manifesting itself in right relationship to each other. We certainly have our rules to guide our common life together, most of which are there to help us treat each other well and safely. But how well we follow rules is not the expression of our faith. It's how we love. And in my church finder ministry, I am continually amazed at how God opens all the right doors, down to finding churches that are not only loving and safe, but have a sailing club for someone whose passion was sailing. I had no idea. Or one that has yoga on the lawn for a mom whose son is autistic and benefited from the practice of yoga. She had been told at her previous church that she needed to start praying now because she had introduced her son to the devil by allowing him to go to yoga. Or one that has ushers that will valet style park your car when the handicapped spaces are full for a woman I was working with who was wheelchair bound. I've knocked a lot and God just keeps opening the doors. Being able to witness the healing that happens when people find joy at church is the best. You may not be aware of the jewel of Christian community that you have here to offer the world, especially if you've not known another faith tradition. So when I hear, I never knew church could be like this, that's the best. God isn't in a box for me anymore, and I need a place where I can explore that. I think it's the Episcopal Church. That's the best. I had someone tell me they looked at a website for an Episcopal church that said, if you don't know what you believe, come on in. If you've got doubts, come on in. She said, I think these are my people. And when I hear someone tell me that my teenager wants to go back next week, that's the best. These are resurrection stories, life from death, and that is very good news. So let's return to Invite, Welcome, Connect for a minute, which is the reason that I'm here. I want to be clear about one thing. This ministry is not about assimilation. Remember, we aren't about doctrine and dogma, so it doesn't mean that everyone has to walk the same path the same way. It's about honoring each individual's authentic journey, nurturing each person intentionally so no one's forgotten or left out. Yesterday, you heard me share in the workshop about a family whose mom was singing in the choir on her second visit to my home church in Texas. Today, in the adult forum, I'll talk about another family that took two years to jump in. The important thing is, those experiences are so very different, but we honor and value them equally. And because we're not assimilating people, we aren't getting people to do anything, right? We're not getting them to stay. We're not getting them to join. We're not making them come to class. When we talk like that, we are deciding the fruit that others are to bear, and that's not our job. 
Our job is to respond to the needs of others for community and spiritual growth and to share about the difference being a Christian makes in our own life. So as you walk more fully into this calling for deeper connection, remember that evangelism isn't for the gifted. We're all called to share the love of Jesus. And if you aren't baptized, there's no stopping you from sharing your experience of God either. You are God's beloved as well. So I want to share a story with you before I go about a family that came to my home church in Texas, um, a mother, a father, and a teenage son and daughter. And they started exploring other faith traditions and decided that they were going to visit the Episcopal Church on Maundy Thursday. Oh yeah, that is going to be their introduction to the Episcopal Church. If you're not familiar with the tradition, Maundy Thursday is an observance during Holy Week. It's in preparation for Good Friday when Jesus died on the cross. It is a somber service. It includes observance of the Lord's meal, the Last Supper, in Holy Communion. There's foot washing, and then what we call stripping of the altar, a very dramatic and intense experience where we take everything that's beautiful and ornamental out of this space. People are known to cry. It's very dramatic. And this was their first visit to the Episcopal Church. I'm happy to say they came back. <laughs> um, wasn't at our church, but the dad described it this way. He said, we got into the car and everyone was silent. And I thought to myself, what have I done? And then the children started talking. And they started talking about how they had never experienced anything like this in a good way. And you see, these folks had grown up, um, the mother and father as children, in the tradition of free will Baptist. And in that church, foot washing is sacramental, and they do it more than once a year. But he had never seen his children participate in this. And he was so moved by seeing his son wash the feet of a stranger in this worship. They came to us on Sunday, on Easter Sunday, and continued to come back and ask a lot of questions about the Episcopal Church. And one Sunday, his wife came in and said, you got to ask Lawrence about his story. And so after church, I approached him and I said, I hear you have a story I need to hear. He said, oh, she told you. <laughs> I have their permission to share this, by the way. So the story that he shared with me was this. At St. Mary's, we give out what we call bags of grace. These are bags we give away with abandon to our newcomers and anyone that comes on our campus. It's got water, food, snacks, hygiene items. It's got clean socks. And we ask people to keep those in your car in case you come across someone in need. We also ask that you ask that person permission to give them that. That's part of respecting dignity. We also encourage people to introduce themselves and ask for their name, because these folks are not faceless nobodies. They are God's children. And by that point, probably the stoplight will have changed, and you'll have to move on. So Lawrence had one of these in his car. And what he shared with me was that at one point he had a second job in downtown Houston. And it was at the courthouse. And his job was security. And more specifically, it was to shoo people away from the property that they didn't want there, homeless people and the like. And he admitted that he had gotten pretty jaded about it. So one day, when he found himself downtown with a bag of grace in his car, he saw someone on the curb. And he thought, well, here it is. I've got my bag. And he got out and he approached the man and asked him if he could give him the bag and told him what was in it. And the man immediately took out the clean socks. And when he started to put them on, he started to cry. And so did my friend Lawrence. They shared a connection that transcends class or status. He said that he shook his hand when he left and that that was a huge thing for him. And what he realized, what he told me was that he had been in a church for many years that never prayed for the poor and that his heart had been in the wrong place for a long time about the poor. 
I share that story because I want to remind you what we're inviting people to. We're not inviting people in because they need to be better or perfected or improved. We're inviting people in to be loved and to love more broadly, to choose mercy. This is the transformation of a life in Christ. Now, how are you going to share the love? Amen.